Professor Dungeon Master here, and this video is sponsored by Mammoth Factory Minis. They reached out to me a couple months back and blew me away with the quality of their work. And now they're kickstarting the Horde of Gondol. Get rich or die trying. I've seen Kickstarter campaigns before, but this is a horde. Over 200 minis, a 300 page hardcover rulebook, eight adventures, 50 magic items, 50 battle maps and NPC cards, all with five E stat blocks. The art and layout are top notch. This is professional, but made by independent creators and non-AI artists. And the miniatures, they are fantastic. Look at this dragon. This is how D&D should be done. Plus, Mammoth has worked with me to develop a special pledge goal, the Deathbringer Mini. Yes, I get an armor upgrade. You do, and if Mammoth hits that stretch goal, it will unlock a Deathbringer SDL so you can play with Deathbringer at your own table. So check out Horde of Gondol at the link below. On with the show. Deathbringer here. Subscribe so you never miss an upload. Early D&D modules look like this. Top down, 150 foot hallways to nowhere, lots of dead ends, different types of monsters living in adjacent rooms that look like ranch style monster condos. And they were filled with save or die traps, NPCs existed primarily to be killed, and villains had names like Hobgoblin Leader. Then came a module that changed everything. Tracy and Laura Hickman's Ravenloft. Released in 1983, Ravenloft looked and felt different. It featured lots of atmospheric box text, isometric maps by David Sutherland, and stunning art by Clyde Caldwell. These elements weren't new. Box text had been used in other modules before, and The Lost City included the first isometric maps. You can see my adaptation of that module in the link below. But Ravenloft combined these elements to create a cohesive product that evoked the feeling of Hammer Horror films. Just look at the images of Christopher Lee and Ingrid Pitt and you can see the influence on Caldwell's work. Look, I love early D&D art. It evokes the do-it-yourself homebrew roots of the hobby, but Ravenloft ushered in the era of Caldwell, Elmore, Easley, and Brom. These guys were painters. Say what you want about Lorraine Williams, but post-Ravenloft modules and books took a major leap forward. Even the font looks more professional. Ravenloft also featured a very memorable villain that would become a classic, a vampire called Strahd von Zarevich. Ravenloft didn't just change D&D modules, it changed the entire course of the game. Dungeons and Dragons would never be the same post Ravenloft, and that's why I'm talking about it on this channel. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about homebrew and independent D&D. Ravenloft was written by the husband and wife team of Laura and Tracy Hickman. It was Laura who introduced Tracy to the game, and although he enjoyed it, he tired of the endless corridors and the hack and slash mentality that characterized early D&D. The team self-published their own modules, which came to the attention of TSR, who hired them to drive out to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and design more. Ravenloft was designed with a set of guidelines first published in the intro to Hickman's first module, Pharaoh. And it had four pillars. One, characters needed goals other than pillaging and killing. Two, an intriguing story woven into play itself. Three, dungeons that made architectural sense. And four, an attainable and honorable end within one to two sessions of playing time. Let's examine each of these. First, the goals. At the start of Ravenloft, a fortune teller would read the character's fortunes with a unique playing card mechanic. The cards would determine random goals and hidden magic items, and the players had to complete the objective before sunrise when they would die and join the parade of dead and become ghosts of Barovia. This meant the module was replayable and Strahd could return in a sequel much like Christopher Lee's Dracula. And I love those old Hammer Horror films. That was part of the fun of it, to see how Dracula could return after being killed off in the previous film. Two, the intriguing story woven into play itself. Like many literary vampires, Strahd had a tragic background. He murdered his brother Sergei because he was in love with his wife, Tatiana. But Tatiana fled from Strahd and plunged to her death, and he becomes a vampire and his land of Barovia is under his evil control. Eventually, Tatiana is reincarnated as an adventuress named Irina, and Strahd pursues her once again. 
Three, the dungeons of Ravenloft make architectural sense. They are isometric and they look like a castle. And fourth, the module was able to be completed in a single night or two sessions. One important but overlooked element is that timer. The players need to complete their goals before they turn into ghosts. The timer drives the narrative and it's something I brought up on this channel again and again. I think adventures need some sort of timer or countdown to propel the action, otherwise they can get draggy. The impact of Ravenloft was immediate and far-reaching. When I wrote for Dungeon Magazine in the early 90s, every villain had to have a background, and mine often had tragic ones, and they owed that to Strahd and Tracy Hickman. If you look at those old magazines, you'll notice that all of the villains have some sort of backstory. They're not just a generic bad guy, and they have some sort of goal they want to attain. Two player expectations completely changed. In early D&D, there was a lot of falling down pits and dying an ignominious death. If you read the example of play in the original DMG, two characters die in two pages. One, a gnome, doesn't even get a saving throw before he's rended apart by a pack of ghouls and he's only first level with five hit points. In the basic set from 1980-81, there's a similar example of play. It's like Black Dougal missed his saving throw. Whoop, he's dead. Let's take his boots and move on. Ravenloft challenged that. It was designed for mid-level characters, so you had enough hit points to make it to the end. And if you died, you probably died fighting Strahd, who was a worthy opponent, not some random 20-foot hole. But the biggest impact, in my opinion, was Ravenloft and the later Dragonlance modules showed us that you could use the D&D game system to tell different types of stories. Tomb of Horrors, for example, is largely about winning. It's about beating the tomb, whereas Ravenloft is about unraveling the story of Strahd. Some people blame Hickman for the decline in sandbox gaming and the rise of epic quest type story gaming, but I don't think that's fair. The word story and story gaming have become something of pejoratives in old school circles, but I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. In my experience, I find that players come for the game, but they stay because of the story. I have one campaign that's been going 30 years, and it's the story and the characters that keep the players coming back to the table. We've switched systems many times, so it's not the system that creates the campaign. It really is the story that drives things and makes those players want to return to the table over and over again. My colleague Luke Hart at DM's Lair had a really insightful video about the Hickman Revolution and how it changed gaming. And his theory is that each version of D&D gets a little bit easier, a little softer, with characters having more hit points and more opportunities to survive because of the expectation the players are gonna make it to the end of the story. And now we look at these stories as long campaigns, ergo, the player should make it to the end of the campaign. And I agree with Luke. I think that 5e d d is the softest version of the game yet, and there are players who just expect their characters to make it to the end of whatever epic quest they are playing. However, I don't think this was Hickman's intention. I played with Tracy Hickman in one of his killer dungeons years ago at Gen Con, and he killed me. I died at about the 20, 22 minute mark. There's also a section in Tracy Hickman's excellent XDM Extreme Dungeon Mastery called Long life boring character. The idea that a character would have a noble sacrifice is a great story idea. If we think of Game of Thrones, the reason that story is interesting is because most of the characters don't make it to the end. And I can't stress how important it is to have an attainable goal in one to two sessions. I have a 30 year campaign, but I've never planned more than one or two sessions ahead. Each session is its own self-contained plot with its own unique villain. And sometimes the villain dies and sometimes they get away. But I never assume the players are going to come back. I really look at it as a movie series where at the end we check the box off as an audience reaction to see if we're going to make a sequel. And that's something I learned from Ravenloft. But no matter what you think of Ravenloft, you have to admit it changed the course of D&D &D forever. And hats off to Tracy Hickman for inspiring me. At least that's what I think. What do you think? Share in the comments below. Also below you'll find links to Dungeon Craft on Patreon, my own game Deathbringer, and you can check out my video on how to run Ravenloft in one night over here, as well as my latest campaign video with Bob Worldbuilder and Baron Darop of Dungeon Masterpiece over here. I'll see you soon. May all your rolls be 20s. Deathbringer again. What does the vampire Strahd call a wizard with a haste spell? Fast food. Now click on these videos and watch more Dungeon Craft. <laughs>